Hi everyone, I'm Steve Lee, welcome to my car and welcome to episode 6 of In Car Alpha, this adventure that we've been on now for a few episodes covering all kinds of questions and issues and topics around Jesus, Christianity, the church, what people believe in and why they believe in it and all that kind of stuff. So if you are here for the first time, firstly, welcome. I hope this helps you to uh, get a bit more of a grasp of an insight into what Christians believe and why. Uh, lots of people believe in God, but they don't actually get to do anything about it because they can't hear it in a way that they can understand. <laughs> that was certainly true for me. So let me encourage you to dig out all the previous episodes of In Car Alpha. It's been quite an adventure. So as I say, this is episode six and the subject is the Bible and the title is Life Book. That's what we're talking about over these next few moments. I've believed in God as long as I can remember, but I didn't grow up in a church family. And I think probably lots of us have got that sort of background. Uh, we have some kind of faith, some sort of belief in God, because let's face it, it takes a lot more faith to believe that all of this came about by accident than there is some kind of designer behind it. But I never understood really who God was. Uh, I certainly couldn't connect with it in terms of any kind of relevance to my particular life, the kind of background that I had. I actually didn't own a Bible that I could understand <laughs> until I was about 16. Uh, again, like a lot of people, I think we are we have a caricature, a stereotype of the Bible that it's just kind of these and thous and thou shalt nots. And that isn't really the way people speak. Uh, and what people don't get is that there are many, many modern contemporary translations of the Bible that are a lot easier to understand. Thank God for that is my response because I do not speak like that. And uh, I grew up in a working class background and I was very grateful when I could have a Bible that I could actually understand. Decades ago, when I was growing up, people used to talk about uh, the big family book. Uh, <laughs> it, it was the Bible. And uh, normally what that meant is that somewhere on a dressing table or in a kitchen somewhere, there was this big family Bible that everyone used to gather around. And that was the basis. I think that's actually a wonderful thing. But uh, <laughs> that wasn't my house. That wasn't how I, how I grew up. I often say that the only big family book that we had in our house was the mail order catalogue uh, that we all used to get our clobber from because my mum I often say my mum was a dealer uh, she was actually an agent that's a much better term than a dealer and uh, and so that was really the family book that's what we all loved and that's what we all gathered around now uh, the particular catalogue was Freeman's. Uh, there was also Kay's catalogue, if any of you are old like me and you can remember that. Uh, and that's all been taken over now by Argos and uh, probably that's all been pushed out by Amazon. So that's a bit of my experience uh, growing up of the Bible. Let's now hear from the streets and some other responses to this whole uh, challenge of the Bible and reading the Bible. Watch this. Have I ever read the Bible? No. I haven't read the Bible. For my own reasons, no. I've skimmed it. I have read the Bible. I kind of looked at little segments, but I've never actually attempted to read, read the whole thing. <laughs> it's not advertised enough, but like I don't go to church, so the time when I do read it is when I'm in church, but other than that, like I don't have a copy of the Bible. They're interesting stories, like as a guide for people how to live, not necessarily taken literally. I thought it was daunting. It just, it's been a long time, so I don't really remember everything. Story of Adam and Eve. Yeah, Adam and Eve. Like stories about uh, Jesus and his life. Of, there, of course, there's Genesis. I don't know the difference between sort of like the different books and stuff, um, but I do know Genesis is the first one. Or is that an argument? I don't know. <laughs> Have you ever wondered why there's often so much guilt around this whole thing of going to church 
and reading the Bible or at least not doing it. So when people are asked the question, do do you go to church? They kind of go, oh, well, no, as if like they're supposed to. Uh, and similarly with the Bible, and you picked it up a little bit there on that clip. Uh, do you read the Bible? People basically say no, but then they feel like they've got to apologise. I wonder what that is and where that where that's uh, coming from. Uh, but what what I do know is this, that, that religion and guilt are always found in the same place. They seem to follow each other around. They're like twins. And that's why I'm very anti-religion. Um, lots of you possibly hearing that for the first time would think, well, what are you talking about? Uh, what you're actually talking about is religion. Look, Christianity is not religion. Christianity is about a relationship with a God who loves us and 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 it's relevant to our life today. Religion is is the stuff of old books and old regulations, and that I want to say, and I've said it before, Jesus went after that more than anything else, actually. So people, are, I think, make the mistake of of picking up an old dusty Bible. Normally it's the King James, it's the authorised version, which has got that old language in it. And then they turn the first page or maybe a few pages in or even halfway through it. They don't get it. They don't understand it. It's written in old English and they end up confused to start with and then guilty afterwards. Now, I want to try to uncover uh, what I believe the Bible is really about and hopefully make it a bit more attractive uh, to you if you're not used to going to church or you're not someone who would describe yourself as a Christian. Let me say some things about the Bible then. The Bible is more of a library uh, than a book. Uh, there's so many books in there, 66 to be precise, uh, in two gigantic volumes, three quarters of a million words. There's books in there about poetry, wisdom, history, crime, prophecy, letters that are written to churches in the New Testament, biographies about individuals, adventures, uh, battles. It's all in there in this epic book, this great storybook, God's big storybook, uh, written over thousands of years of history. So before we pick it up for the first time and start to read it, we've got to get a little bit of that in terms of a context so we can understand what we are reading about. This is the epic story of God and God's dealings with the people that he loves. First the nation of Israel in the Old Testament and then when Jesus came and the years after it the birth of the church and the miraculous ministry of Jesus which was the foundation stone of what the disciples that which were his followers who then went on to become the first leaders of the church. What they were all about was the power of God that broke out of Jesus. And then Jesus said, you will go on to do the things that I have done. And the first part of the New Testament is about Jesus. And then after that, it is the epic story of the church. I've got a few Bibles now. Most of them are in modern translations. I do read the King James Version sometimes. I think there is a richness to it, uh, but I would recommend that you first get hold of a Bible that you can really relate to. There's a translation, or probably more accurately, a paraphrase of the Bible called The Message. I love it. I use it a lot. I read it a lot. I quote from it a lot. And when I'm doing my my talks, if you like, uh, most of the time I'm talking to people who uh, are not sure where they sit with this whole thing. So I feel that the message is a brilliant version of the Bible because it is written in very contemporary English. I want to say as well, I want to be really honest. I was quite honest last time when we talked about prayer. Uh, but let me be honest again and say I'm not a natural reader. Uh, I actually struggled when I was at school. Um, probably if I was at school today, I probably would have, um, I don't know if it would be mild dyslexia, but I definitely had some issues in terms of reading. I had a bad stammer or a stutter. Uh, that was really my story and my background. And I am not a reader. You know, the idea of sitting down with a blanket and a good book uh, is not really me. So I've had to overcome some guilt with all of this, believing that 
you know, I'm not a very good Christian early on. Um, well, I often think that now, but because I don't read the Bible for hours and hours a day because I'm just not a reader. So most of the versions that I've got are on my iPhone, on my iPad, uh, audio books I'm really into. So I absorb the Bible that way as well. So I say those things to encourage you if you are new to this Christian thing or you are exploring it, please don't think that you've got to sit down with a big fat book with a black cover with Holy Bible written on the front in order to connect with God and to connect with this amazing, amazing, transforming message called the Gospel of Jesus, Jesus Christ. Don't get the idea from me that I'm trying to say you've got to commit hours and hours of reading a boring old book that most of us couldn't relate to anyway. There are other ways, other versions and other... Uh, 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 types of activity that we can engage with that connect us with the written word that is in the Bible. It's an amazing book for sure and uh, this is what Abraham Lincoln said, 16th President of the United States of America. This is what he had to say about this amazing book called the Bible. I believe the Bible is the best gift God has ever given to us all the good from the saviour or jesus the saviour of the world is in this book abraham lincoln people use all sorts of words to describe the bible and you probably heard a few from the people on the street there depending on your background <laughs> depending on what you've been taught depending on your experience of the church or religion or christianity good or bad it will definitely affect the words that you use to describe the Bible. Some of them are not very positive, uh, but let me give you three words uh, 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 today that really are the, the three words that I want to suggest, uh, and I'll, I'll break them all down for a couple of minutes. The first one is unique. I'll explain it. Uh, the second one is survived, and the third one is living. So let's talk about unique for a moment or so. In these days of social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, everything is like a newsflash. You know, we hear it very quickly. It's very short. And of course, it's retweeted or shared or whatever across social media. And that has affected the way that we absorb information and the way that we absorb news and the way that we decide whether something is good or bad, attractive or unattractive, true or false. It's really all affected by the modern digital media that we are either engaged fully with or surrounded by we can't escape it but you see the bible's different to that the bible is not a news flash it is a timeless message in a gigantic book which i want to suggest to you is an eternal handbook for living it's People describe it as the word of God. Uh, it's the written word of God. The Bible says of itself that Jesus is the word of God. But we all know what we mean when people say that it is the word of God. It is the written word of God. It's an absolute unique book. It's a one-off. There is nothing else like it. Here are some of those breathtaking statistics about this famous old book called the Bible. I've already given you a couple of them but let me give you some more. The Bible is the most popular book in the world and it has been for generations. It's the world's number one bestseller. It's written over a period of 1500 years. I've already said this but three quarters of a million words, two volumes, 66 books, 40 separate authors, among them kings, doctors, fishermen, poets. It's been translated okay. into two something to hold on to, something to uh, go to in times of doubt. Uh, faith to me is um, believing in something 100%. Something that you're passionate about, something that you're, you stick to. I believe in God and I, yeah, I believe if you pray that stuff happens, I do. If I live a good enough life that whatever God there is, he's going to understand that I'm not right. So there you have it. I have no faith now. My belief isn't really a belief. It doesn't really matter if you believe in a set of values, for example. I think that that's great. Faith means believing in someone, I guess. I don't know what there is, but I think there's something. I, I do know a lot of people that uh, have a lot of faith. I like the idea okay, of evolution. I think it's good to believe in something. I don't think it's something that people need necessarily. 
this will but certainly give you a little bit more of an insight into a particular uh, type of information that's in the Bible. This is a short film called Jesus Decrypt. I hope you enjoy it. This ticket gets me into this fabulous old English mansion. But in 1943, as war raged across Europe, you would have had zero chance of getting anywhere near this place without the highest level of security clearance from the British government. This is a story of secrecy, espionage and code breaking. Welcome to Bletchley Park. I devote much of my time and energy to decoding the whole Christian thing to people who have no background in the church whatsoever. A lot of people believe in God, but they don't take a step towards him because they assume that you've got to know a religious language that only religious types understand. But 2,000 years ago, God did something incredible to deal with our separation from him. He sent his son, Jesus, to come and live on the earth as a man, to speak our language, to live the way that we live, and to act as a signpost back to him. Jesus never came to start a religion. He came to replace religion with relationship. For 50 years, this place was the nerve center for British military intelligence but it's famous for one wartime endeavor, the breaking of the unbreakable Nazi Enigma code. The orders and communiques of imminent bombing raids, submarine attacks and troop movements were fed into a weird looking typewriter nicknamed the Crooked Hand of Death. The messages were readily accessible and regularly intercepted, but the Enigma machines had scrambled the messages into an unrecognizable gibberish. So ships were sunk, towns were bombed, and people died while mathematicians worked here against the clock in a frantic attempt to break the Enigma code. Through his life, Jesus was the living decrypt of God's eternal and unfathomable truth. He told stories that people understood, stories of a kingdom of love, of a father who searches for us and our eternal home in heaven. Jesus said this, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. And if you have seen me, you have seen the father. The humble loved him and followed him, but the proud despised him and crucified him. The first part of the Bible, known as the Old Testament, contains over 300 coded messages, predictions or prophecies about what the Son of God would look like when he appeared. His birth in Bethlehem, the kind of friends he would have, the things he would say, how we would live, and his death on the cross. Jesus was the living fulfillment of every one of those prophecies. A mathematician on par with the ones who worked here at Bletchley Park during the war said this, the chances of somebody's life lining up with all of those prophecies without him being the one that they were pointing to was equivalent to covering the whole of England in coins and then correctly turning over the right one first time. Or about as likely as breaking the Enigma code purely by guesswork. Pretty unlikely. But in 1943, 
the Enigma riddle was solved. Thanks to a man called Alan Turing, a brilliant team and a super smart machine. That machine is the ancestor of lots of other smart machines that are all over the world today. You may have heard of them, they're called computers. Being a Christian is not rocket science. You don't need to have a brain the size of a small city, a degree from a posh university, or a fancy machine. You simply need to humble yourself, take a step of faith towards God, and understand that when Jesus lived, died, and rose again, he did it to provide us with a second chance. Jesus is the answer to the great puzzle of life. Why not make this prayer your prayer? Father God, I put my trust in you and commit my future into your hands. Forgive me for living independently of you. I want to live out your perfect plan for my life. I receive the gift of a new beginning today through Jesus, your son. Amen. So there you go. So I've already said the Bible is unique. Uh, I said that the second word is survived. What on earth do I mean by that? Well, even the fact that we have the Bible with us today in such vast quantities in print, in audio, in digital form, it is something quite remarkable. This book has been through unprecedented, unparalleled levels of attack, criticism and abuse. I wonder why that is. There is no other book in the world at any other time in history that has been banned and burnt like the Bible. It contains lots of miracle stories as I've already said, the life and times of Jesus, that three year period of time where the sick were healed and the dead were raised and the lonely were loved and then the baton passed to the disciples and they were able to carry on the same type of work that Jesus did and it's never stopped in the church there's been a remnant of that all the way through the last 2,000 years but maybe the greatest miracle around the Bible is its survival itself there's a, a story of a fl French flinch, a French philosopher, which is easy for me to say, called Voltaire. He was not known for his sympathetic views about the Christian faith. He actually detested the Bible. He detested Christians and hated Christianity. And he, he made a prediction that within a hundred years of his death, uh, the Bible would be uh, obsolete that it would be removed and eradicated from the face of the earth. Here's what happened. 50 years after his death, the Bible Society had bought his house and uh, were using his printing presses to produce huge numbers of copies of the Bible. And 250 years or more after the death of Voltaire, the Bible is going strong. So there's a little bit of irony around this as well. The people who have criticised the Bible often end up deeply affected by it. There's a guy called Josh McDowell in America. He wrote a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. It's pretty thick. It's pretty, uh, uh, it's pretty highbrow, very intelligent guy. And his story is amazing. He uh, was another person who didn't like Christians. And at university, he decided to study the Bible with the view of disproving it and disproving Christianity and in his own words he ended up face to face with the reality and authenticity of the Bible of Jesus Christ and his claims upon his life and he became a Christian and now uh, he's, a, he's a fairly old guy now but he is one of the leading voices in back into the universities defending the Bible very interesting but even those people who mistrust and reject the Bible it does appear that there is an invisible power that is almost protecting the Bible from destruction so my third point my last point is that the Bible is living you've probably heard this before but often people say the Bible contradicts itself well we haven't got time to go on to, into too much of this now 
uh, but there are certainly contrasting views in the Bible. Uh, there is a picture of God in the Old Testament that can appear at odds with the picture of God in the New Testament. There are answers to those questions, but rather than the Bible contradicting itself, I think maybe the biggest problem is that it contradicts us. Uh, it says something about our behaviour, about our actions, about our nature, uh, often which isn't good. And it addresses those uh, particular uh, uh, problems. And I think that's why the Bible is often uncomfortable reading, because it speaks right into the heart of the human problem. The author Mark Twain said this, It's not the bits of the Bible I can't understand that bother me. It's the bits that I can. <laughs> Very honest. I think that's true for a lot of us. You, you come across something in the Bible and it's like looking in a mirror. You see something which feels incredibly current and incredibly uh, 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 real and relevant, even though it's written many hundreds, thousands of years ago, 2,000 years ago. Millions of people who read this book uh, talk about... Uh, being spiritually fed by it like it is living it's like spiritual food it does us good that's my experience and I encourage you to test the Bible out in that way as well Jesus had something to say about this whole thing about the need for both physical food and spiritual food he actually said it after treating 5,000 people to or more 5,000 men a lot more if you add the women and children but because of the culture, they only counted the guys. Uh, but there were thousands of people that were free, treated, treated, treated to a free lunch by Jesus on the side of a mountain. You've probably heard it. It's called the feeding of the five thousands, or the loaves and the fishes. And after that amazing event, and again, it's another story for another day. But uh, these are the words from Jesus in Matthew's Gospel, chapter four and verse four. This is what he said: "Man or people shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God." Spiritual food, very interesting. Material things are not enough to bring us or provide us with the sustenance or the satisfaction that we need in order to survive. Bread is important, but spiritual bread is important as well. Jesus actually, after providing all these people with bread, he said, I am the bread of life. Now that's really interesting. If I'd have been in that crowd, I'd have been thinking, Okay, so is that the bread or, or are you the bread? What's the bread? Who's, who's the bread? But of course, Jesus is talking about the spiritual bread. He's saying you need that. But if you just have that, you're going to get hungry and you're going to want to come back and you're going to need to come back. But the spiritual bread is going to satisfy the deepest hunger. Let me finish by telling you a short story. Uh, it's happened 150 years ago or more. It was about an actor who toured a live show in outdoor amphitheatres around the around England. And as part of his um, show, he recited Psalm 23. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. Quite a familiar passage from the Old Testament of the Bible. And he, he recounted it. And uh, it was in an afternoon matinee and there was a guy, a young guy who was sitting in the crowd and he went up to this guy at the end and he said, tonight, when you do the performance, could I recite Psalm 23? It was a rather strange request, but he thought, well, why not? Let's get a young person involved. Now, let me read this, this Psalm uh, from one of those modern translations of the Bible that I talked about right at the beginning. And you may be familiar with the, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, he makes me lie down. You might be familiar with that. That's the old version. But let me read it to you in a really modern version of the Bible. Listen to this. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. You have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath. And then you send me in the right direction, even though the way goes through Death Valley. 
I'm not afraid when you walk by my side. Your trusty shepherd's crook makes me feel secure. You serve me a six-course dinner right in front of my enemies. You revive my drooping head. My cup brims with blessing. Your beauty and your love chase after me every day. And my li- every day of my life, and now I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. That's a modern translation of Psalm 23. So that's what he recited. That's what the young guy recited. And at the end of the show, and that was the final contribution, the actor and the young guy looked out from the stage and everyone was totally silent, transfixed on this young guy. And many of them were weeping and were very emotional. And the actor turned to this young guy and he said, I've recited that passage from the Bible hundreds of times. I had never seen that reaction. Tell me, what's the difference between you and me? And this is what the young guy said. Because you know the book, but I know the author. And that's the key. It's not about me sitting here trying to prove to you that the Bible is an accurate document, although I absolutely believe that to be the case. But in terms of what we're talking about today and the context of this in-car adventure, these chats I feel that we're having with one another, I want to say to you that it's more important to know the author, the God of the Bible, than just the book. That's why people can go through university studying the Bible and end up further away from God when they came out than when they went in. It is so important that we understand that this is a living book. It breathes. It has an author. It has an author who wants to take these eternal words, these ancient words, and apply them into our lives in a way that are absolutely uh, a life-giving and transformational. Hope that's really helped you today. As is always the case, you can interact in the normal way online, but please talk to people that you know who may have pointed you towards this, and you might know our church people, and they love God, and they're followers of Jesus. They will be able to help you and point you in the right direction. And I will see you next time. God bless you.